Hello, testing, testing. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, remaining in the room. Uh, how many people here are doing the Austin CTF? Wow, okay, this is awesome. Well, thanks for attending, appreciate it. I expected to see a lot of heads down in computers. Uh, my name is Matt Bromley, this is my colleague Preston Lewis, and today we're gonna be talking to you about a really, really long ass PowerPoint titled Talk. Uh, attacking the hospitality and gaming industries, tracking an attacker around the world in seven years. We were trying to do some sort of Jules Verne really really smart play on words with this and eventually just turned into, yeah, this is like really, really prolific. Um, anyone here stayed in a hotel in the past seven years? All right, okay, good, some involvement. Anyone eaten in a restaurant in the past seven years? Anyone gambled in the past seven years? Awesome, okay, sorry, I know that's a lot of up and down with your hands. Uh, there's a very, very, very good chance, without knowing it, you've run into these guys and had some sort of an interaction with them. And I say guys only because I'm not sure uh, what the team is actually made up of, so we're just going to go with some general terms. Um, however, we're going to have fun. Um, we're going to do a little bit of attribution. Uh, we're going to talk about just how prolific they are. And uh, anyone here had a credit or debit card replaced uh, in the past seven years or so? Usually if you had your hand up for one of the previous three, probably in this one. Uh, yeah, you can blame these guys. Um, you can walk out of here saying, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Oh, there's, a, there's like a double mic. It's like a double mic echo thing here. So, uh, Preston and I are consultants, which means we have to give you an agenda slide that tells you what we're going to talk about. Um, this is just like something that's ingrained in our blood. Uh, but guess what? We're actually just going to skip past this and just talk to you about it. <clears throat> so, as mentioned, my name is Matt Bromley. Uh, I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. I'm a senior incident response consultant with a tiny little company called Mandiant. Uh, they're part of a much different company called FireEye. Um, I am not here to talk about FireEye's stock price. Um, I'm not here to talk about FireEye products. I'm not here to talk about China, believe it or not. Um, if you guys if you want to give you a moment to get up and walk out, um, we can certainly do that. Uh, I'm a digital forensic and incident response fanatic and nut. Um, I'm in one of those weird cases where someone's like, what do you like to do for fun? And I'm like, my job. And they're like, what do you do for your job? I was like, have fun. So I'm kind of torn. I really, really love this. When I'm not doing my job, I'm a huge barbecue fanatic. Anyone here visited the food trucks downtown? By the way, is this anyone else's first time to Grand Rapids? Really? What a city. Holy crap, this place is awesome. I don't know if it's just the art thing going on that's like amplifying how amazing it is, but it's pretty cool. I'm also convinced that every child in Michigan is in the city right now. Um, and aside from these fun things, I really just do whatever the hell else my wife tells me to do. Um, if you're married, you know exactly what I mean. If you're engaged, sorry for the preview, but it gets a little grim. Preston, by the way, is engaged. <coughs> I am engaged, yes. Yeah, so. I, I'm getting the, the that torture right now. Uh, so I, I live in Houston. Um, I moved there for the fiance. I, it wasn't my first choice, but H-Town has a, has a pretty nice uh, culinary experience. So uh, I recommend going down there just for that at least. Uh, again, you know, I, I'm my IR guy with Matt. I'm not here to talk about Manian services. I'm not here to talk about fire services. Uh, this particular talk, one, we just really enjoy this attack group. And as we get into it, you'll see, I think there's some peculiarities with this attacker that uh, kind of just makes this decided it's a little different than normal and so spare time uh you know running cycling um, huge coffee guy i love grinding my own beans and, and just experiencing with the whole pour overs and then of course netflix and chill just hanging out doing that good stuff once that ring goes down that list is going to change and you guys know it is it's going to turn into the same thing as mine <clears throat> all right let's talk a little bit about the background of this attacker so we had the word fin5 up there. You may be wondering to yourself, fin, what, uh, what does that mean? Fin's really easy. It's a financially motivated threat group. That means they want, at the end of the day, to make money. A lot of other threat groups want to steal secrets. They want to have social security numbers, passports. Anyone here affected by the OPM breach? Nah, at least that's okay. You don't have to let me know because you shouldn't be letting me know. But in any event, they are not interested in that kind of stuff. They want money. They want your credit card data. They want some identity information that can usually then lead to making money in a different way. They want to be able to buy stuff, fence it, sell it, do whatever they can to just get as much profit as possible. If anyone here has ever seen any of those news reports about these tiny, tiny little towns inside of Eastern Europe that all of a sudden in the past five years have become the Ferrari and Lamborghini hubs of the world, this threat group is one of the reasons why. The other thing too to note about the track data, if you guys aren't too familiar with PCI data itself, um, there's you know multiple tracks. There's three, in fact, on the back of a credit card 
track one, track two, and both of which contain various amounts of information. So sometimes they only target track two information, so they can copy that mag stripe and sell the actual physical card itself. Uh, the other identifying information is then they can mask that information on the front of the card as well, right? So they have the track two data, then they can mask that front of the uh, pan so that the uh, you know ID itself matches whatever information they want. So when you go swipe your card, uh, the cashier may in fact be able to validate it, and so that's how they can actually sell those more uh, more valid and more accurate. Anyone here ever clone any cards and knew, knew that before Preston said it? Don't raise your hand. Don't don't raise your hand. <clears throat> This is being recorded. And we'll, and we'll show you how easy, in <laughs> fact, this, this whole process is. That's why we like it so much. This attack group, um, again, as we'll walk through this, uh, takes a very targeted and novice approach. Like it's a strange balance between uh, very smart yet very awful at what they're doing. They're also extremely successful. They've made a lot of money by doing this. And um, as you'll see, uh, they're not stopping. They're not slowing down. They're continuing to make a ton of money. So if anyone works in any of the industries that are inside of our title slides, we're going to give you some recommendations to go back, and you can find your own Fin5 and create your own adventure and have fun. And hopefully you don't find them. And I'm not going to say call me if you find them, but you got my number. So we did the why. Who's the who and the where? So these are most likely Russian-speaking attackers. Any threat intel people in the room? Notice how careful I am about Russian speaking, not Russian. There's a very big difference between the two. They are relentlessly target-oriented, which means very, very few things stop them. And the reason we say that they're Russian speaking, well, they are nice enough. Believe it or not, they are malware authors who leave comments in code, and they are very, very strategic, and they like to display what changes they made. So all of these changes are written in Russian. Now, it's very possible that they're just adopting software. However, we're going to assume that their understanding of the comments, therefore their ability to use the code, gives them the ability to speak that. They also have a thorough understanding of payment card brands. So I know we've got some folks here who work in industries or work at companies that process the type of information. It is not as simple, they can tell you, as putting up a server in somewhere in a data center and saying, okay, now I process credit cards. There is an environment you have to build. You have to lock it down. There's some made-up council that is going to pretend like they have oversight over what you're doing and fine you if you are not doing what they say you should be doing. There's also going to be other companies knocking down your door and auditors who want to, uh, who want to go through and audit all of this for you. It is a very, very, very complex process, and these guys know it very well. And then also, just to give and give you a background as well, the whole payment card fraud process, if you guys aren't too familiar with how that works, typically there's one of two things that happen. One, uh, the card brands or your acquiring banks, so like Chase or Bank of America, identify a common point of purchase. They have a, you know, an Intel team, an analytics team that says, we've had a whole bunch of compromised cards or people calling in with fraud. And they can identify that at one particular common point of purchase. So they'll then notify the retailer there's a CPP. Additionally, uh, in, it's becoming more increasing or more uh, frequent where the client itself identifies that there was some AV alert or perhaps they identified some malicious service running and then that process kicks off. What typically happens is a PFI, a professional forensic investigation. Uh, and then that's when, you know, the consultants come in and, and identify, you know, what happened, the exposure windows, et cetera. And that's really this whole payment process, fraud process that these particular attackers tend to know very well. And we'll touch on what that means in a few more slides. Can you guys tell Preston's the QSA in the room? Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm the one that has that horrible responsibility. If a boss of yours comes to you and says, do you want to be a QSA? I'd recommend running the other direction. <laughs> Not because of the type of activity, but just the paperwork involved. It's uh, a lot of fun. All right, continuing on the who and where. Uh, where? Well, I mean, wherever there's a restaurant, a hotel, or some sort of gaming facility, doesn't really matter to them. Uh, it's easy to be U.S. focused. Can anyone think really quickly why it's easy to be U.S. focused? Because it took us forever to get the pin and chip. That's why. And it's really, really simple. And guess what? When all that started to become into legislation, what do you think happened with this attack group? There was a bum rush on all the industries. Holy crap, they're going to phase all this stuff out. Let's go hunting. Let's go have some fun. A couple different things about the who and where. Number one, they have extreme operational sophistication. Now, it's really, really weird to sit here and call an attacker sophisticated and say that we enjoy an attack group. However, I'd be a fool if I said they weren't, primarily because I don't want them to come after me. But they are very, very sophisticated in a couple different ways. Number one, they usually know an environment better than the, the IT or the InfoSec team does. Number two, they monitor for detection and notification. 
One of the things Preston just talked about was if fraud is detected, you're going to get an email from someone that says, hey, we detected fraud. You might want to look into this. These guys are watching for that email. When it gets there, we're going to talk in a little bit, but when it gets there, they're already out the door. Second, burn before you sell. Really, really, really good methodology that these guys stick to. They burn down the infrastructure, and then they start to sell cards. So for anyone unfamiliar with the fraud process, I know that Brian Krebs has made a lot of money out of telling us about how awful fraud is. However, the way that it works is these cards end up going for sale. And when they go for sale, there are people in law enforcement who sit, they buy these cards, and then they start to do all the analytics, the common points of purchase. That's how they can zero in on a hotel, on a restaurant, on a, on a casino, whatever it may be, because they've done that analysis ahead of time. These guys, they don't want to get caught with their infrastructure, so they burn it down. Luckily, we're good enough to have caught them. And who else they go after? Restaurants, hotels, gaming. This is me having some PowerPoint fun and just showing that there's a lot of different places inside the wonderful city of Las Vegas that have unfortunately fallen victim to this. Now, granted, those are just randomly placed target signs, <laughs> not actual client names. There's two on Paris, for example, but that's like a DEF CON shout out. <clears throat> why? Can anyone think of why? Kind of already given this one away. It's really, really easy. Cash money, baby. I'm trying to make that paper. So are these guys. They are actually a lot more successful at making it than I am, and they do it a lot faster. Talked about the why. Let's take a look at the when. This one's really funny. I, I wish this slide wasn't here, but it really is. Uh, 2008 until now. Why do we say 2008? Remember that code comment? Yep, 2008, there was some modifications being done to this code. The comment is still in the malware today. Why do we say till now? Uh, well, because we've got virus total submissions dating back to September 20th, 2016. But this kind of still feels old. You guys want some new shit? How about two days ago, they were still active in an environment, breaking in for the first time, dumping credentials and moving laterally around. Yes, that's right. Right effing now. These guys are still at it. So welcome to a live attack group presentation and a walkthrough of how they do what they do. Yeah, when we got this information, we were like, how fortuitous. I mean, we're <laughs> sitting here at this con, you know, clients are engaging us, and we're like, this is crazy. Like, yeah. Ben Fives still wants happening. to help us out. Still happening. Thanks a lot. I, I, I'm convinced they probably read the schedule and were like, let's <laughs> give these guys a bone. Uh, let's go repone an environment. Um, if one day Preston and myself end up talking with you about this slide, I apologize for calling out your reponed environment. Although I, I think we're good to go. And last but not least, let's talk about the how. The very, very honed attack methodology that we're actually going to break into in just a second. They use, anyone here heard of the term raw POS? I would hope so. It's been advised about and been talked about in the news for since 2008. So we're coming up on eight years now this has been known about. It's very, very noisy but effective. I've got a 20-month-old at home. I cannot stand when she screams, but God, it stops me from what I'm doing. These guys are extremely noisy. Any forensic investigators in the room? DFIR people? There's got to be at least one. I know there's at least one. He's just looking at his phone right now. <laughs> um, they are noisy. There's an artifact plethora that they leave behind. We're going to talk about that. And last but not least, they have a slow software maturity cycle as well. Remember we talked about code that had been edited in 2008 still in there. They don't need to change it because it still works. Software has been, malware has been talked about since 2008, and it still works. It's still compromising environments. It's still stealing credit card numbers. If it ain't broke, then why fix it? And, and you might be asking yourself, what about AV? Like, they've been around for eight years. How come this is still a thing? And the problem is, uh, at least in the clients that we've gone to, they're just not monitoring AV. A lot of times you'll see alerts for, you know, these particular MIM scrapers, et cetera, and our clients are like, why didn't our AV stop this? It's like, well, you have it on monitoring mode. Have you been monitoring this? But, but guys, let's be fair. I mean, everyone in this room who has AV, you're monitoring your logs 24-7, right? You know every time a piece of ransomware <laughs> drops in the system. I know. I have absolute trust in what's going on. All right. Preston, talk to us about this life cycle. So the attacker life cycle, uh, you Boring probably graphic. all have seen this slide or a variation of this particular slide a uh, hundred times. And so what's interesting here is it's no different. This attack life cycle uh, and the way that this attack group works is very similar. And the way I'm going to couch these next couple of slides is kind of in two perspectives, a blue team perspective and a red team perspective. You know, from a defensive perspective, what is it that we could look for? What are my sources of evidence? From a red team perspective, what am I leaving behind? When I, you know, choose to uh, attack a network, you know, what do I need to be careful about so that this blue team doesn't identify myself? And so, you know, I'm kind of wanting to frame this for this particular attack group, but interestingly enough, it has a great set of skills in both sides of the camp to kind of give us some information uh, for, you know, red team or blue team. 
So for Fin5 specifically, hang on a sec, Preston. Look at that badass hacker photo lining up that keyboard like a shotgun. I love it. It's great. So for legitimate access, Fin5 by and large uses legitimate access. How do they get that access? Most likely through third party vendors. And that's what's so difficult about identifying this malicious traffic is they're using legitimate access. VPN, single factor, it's hard to identify that even if you're looking for it because generally vendors are in your in your environment almost every day, you know, hourly. So how is this information going to look any different? And we'll touch on some of those, perhaps GOIP, those types of information, some frequency of occurrence, that type of information, we can look at that. But again, legitimate access using VPN, Citrix, et cetera, that's going to be their method of gaining access into the environment. Generally, they also probably have permissions, the credentials to elevate or they're already at domain admin by and large for a lot of these particular third party vendors. They might not need to escalate, but we'll touch on what they actually use there too. Red teamers, who still runs into single factor off at like huge, massive, I cannot believe this is here clients. Yep. Tech groups do too. And then on that same token, uh, we have a client that I'm working with right now. Their two factor quote unquote isn't two factors when you email that person their second factor, or the second factor is an image sitting on their desktop. So again, this idea of two factor, oh, I'm two factor, so I'm safe. Well, how actually is this a second factor if it's already on the PC that you compromise? So again, these types of things are things that you just need to consider and ensure the implementation isn't flawed. Because what we're finding is by and large, they are. And so just having a second factor uh, VPN, that's not your golden ticket. Once they're inside their, the environment, they've you know used legitimate credentials to get in. Now they begin doing some reconnaissance. Everything that you've been you know going through as a red team, in map like capabilities, they're using. They particularly for Fin5 use essential net tools. Has anyone they, here used essential net tools before as part of a red team operation? Ah, it's a nice, pretty GUI. It gives you out CSVs. It's not like some badass command line tool. It's uh it's free and it's available and you know it's really really pretty and nice looking. It's like an introduction to network scanning. Exactly. Yeah. There's there's nothing fancy about this tool, and they use it on every engagement. Why? So they can begin to build a list of hosts, so things that they know that they can then begin to deploy their malware to. Right. But from a blue team perspective, what does this tell me? Well, I can actually begin to see in the registry for specifically essential net tools the last scan that somebody had executed using essential net tools. So we can then use this information from the registry to identify what did they scan. Now again, this is the last time that this was used, so it may depend on when it was executed, but generally speaking, we can then see, okay, they scanned this net block or this net range, and it's gonna be stored in the registry. And so we leverage that uh, in our scoping environment to see you know, what was their pivot point. Usually when they're deploying net tools, this is their first uh, compromised system, so they can then begin looking elsewhere in the environment to see what 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 I need to know about this environment so that I can then find the, the you know the target of interest. Yeah, the beauty about finding net tools on a host is we've usually either found the first compromised host or we found the privilege access jump box that they're using. So luckily this artifact carries a couple different attributes with it that help us pinpoint how the attackers are moving through the network. But the most important consideration I'd say on this slide is uh Red teamers, what are you guys leaving behind? Now we didn't get any hands up for essential net tools, not really surprising me. Um, it's like an odd tool that everyone's heard of, but very few people have used. But very, very good consideration there. Um, if you come in and do a network scan and I'm hunting through registry looking for this and it is not a legitimate tool in my environment, guess what? I've just found the range that you, well, the last range that you went after. Exactly. And so then once I've identified or once Fin5 has identified a, a range of hosts or they've been given, you know, reconnaissance information, now they need to be able to deploy their malware. So now that they have a list of hosts, again, they're still very early on in the investigation or in the the attack lifecycle. But then we're talking like if I was to put this in within time frames of Windows, uh, we're looking at one hour within the time that they've gained access into the environment, ran net tools, you know, gotten a list of IP addresses that they want to begin looking for. How am I going to actually now be getting getting remote execution on these other hosts? They typically have domain admin at this point, or if not, they begin doing uh, privilege escalation. So these two particular parts may, you know, go in between one another, but generally they can uh, privilege escalate using WCE, which we'll talk about, or they're going to use PS exec to push their malware to these hosts. Um, by and large, these are um, automated scripts as well. But what's interesting here for their particular PS exec 
it is almost a bit for bit copy of the sys internals PS exec with some slight changes. And those slight changes, um, we believe are for anti forensics. So if you're looking or hunting for PS exec, um, execution in your system logs, you know, you might be able to identify this is something that's anomalous. It's being used by a, a, a credentials that don't typically use PS exec. But if you're not searching for a, a random string, uh, you're, you're going to miss this execution. Yeah, I would say it's tough to uh, to look for a service that was installed called service. It's not really an easy. Uh, it's not really an easy keyword. Anyone here not use PS exec or it's banned in your environment from being used? Wow. Okay. All right. We have not worked on any of these clients. We're good to go. Some places I've been at, sys internals is banned, not allowed, not, can't have it. So then we pull up an event log and we show three days worth of PS exec activity and the color just drops because they're like, that is not supposed to be here whatsoever. Just think about that. If you've got a tool that you know an attack group uses and you know they're coming after your industry and you don't use that legitimately or you only use it sporadically, check your <laughs> logs, see if it's in there. But again, it's really tough to look at this example here and say, well, how do I search for this random name service? Anyone else see another indicator in these two event log snapshots? Remember, we're talking about PS exec. PS exec is not named frame package.exe. <laughs> Anyone know what the real frame package is? What's that? McAfee installer. So all of a sudden you've got frame package doing PS exec lateral movement activities. Something does not make sense in this case. So again, red team, what are your modified tools leaving behind? Blue team, what does not make sense about what I'm looking at? Exactly. So now that we have the ability to push malware, you know, taking a step back and understanding the bigger picture again as a financial attacker, Fin5 wants track data. They want credit card information. So what are they going to do to get to that information? Sure, they could spend some time doing some recon like we've just been seeing, trying to find the point of sale terminals or the point of sale servers, or they can take a lazy approach. FiendCry, this is our internal name, it, all it simply is, is a memory scraper, right? Everyone kind of knows that term memory scraper, but essentially all it does is scan through process memory, looking for regular expressions that it knows. Specifically, you want to see, see an ugly regex? And that's the other thing too, these guys aren't efficient. They, this isn't the best regex for track data, right? It doesn't matter, they don't care. What they do is they deploy this RAM scraper to every host, and when I say every host, literally workstations, it doesn't matter. Laptops that will of course not have track data on it, looking for track data, they don't care. So what happens is they automate this to begin finding the systems that do have the track data. And we've seen them gone. Uh, there's been odd times when they have had randomly false positives. Again, this, this regex isn't perfect, so it will have false positives. And we've seen them deploy malware to systems that aren't, that have nothing to do with track data yet. They're deploying it there because they don't care. Again, we call this stage one in particular because we'll see it again later, but to note this particular variant of this attack cycle uh, is all process memory. It has no targeted processes. It's scanning all of process memory looking for regular expression. So again, they spray the entire environment. They scan all of the processes for track data. Once they've done that, again, automated scripts will, um, from their same pivot point, pull back these results because they will be saved to a specific mem dump uh, directory on the host. They pull that information back, retrieve it, simply scan through it to find the systems of interest. Generally, it's going to be your point of sale servers because that's where all the track data will live. And then they'll move forward. Uh, this is the output for that uh, FiendCry memory dumper. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, it gives you uh, those instructions if you don't know how to use it. The other thing that's interesting here as well, or another artifact, is these uh, regular expression extractions are dumped in clear text. So on disk, you have clear text track data from this particular stage one. There's no obfuscation, there's no encryption, all clear text. When they pull it back, it's then removed. And we'll get into that too. Now you may be saying to yourself, wait, 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 my DLP would catch that. Is DLP installed on a credit card processing server? Not normally, no. So then we get into actually conducting the mission, right? So they've pulled back all of these cards and they've identified that, oh, this particular IP address, this particular host name is what processes the cards for this environment. Let me go get on that host. So what they do is we call this particular cycle the Fin5 triad. So there's three particular uh, pieces of malware that didn't get, that then get deployed. Um, specifically, the Dubru launcher. Dubru launcher is, again, a very novice concept. 
It's a Perl, Perl to exe binary that simply launches two other executables. Nothing fancy other than a simple, you know, com spec call to that particular process name or binary on disk launches that particular process. That's all it is. Doesn't do anything else. But what's unique about it, it has a, ser a service persistent. So that's how it maintains execution on the disk is it sets itself as a service. Uh, generally, it's going to be named a very legitimate looking um, service or a service that isn't currently running. It'll name itself after that so that if you were to review these services or un try to you know, think something's malicious going on, it's going to look very similar to, to other legitimate processes running. It's also going to install itself with a service description that says, if you disable this, your computer will not work. And it's something like Windows Help Management Aid add-on or something where you're like, ah, this could be legit. There's no Google results. And it says I shouldn't do it. So uh, let's just leave it alone. So then we jump into FiendCry, stage two. So that Dubru launcher will then launch FiendCry, the stage two FiendCry. What's different about this particular FiendCry stage two is now we're talking a specific targeted process. So the FinCry stage one, actually, when it dumps that track data to disk, it also identifies the running process and PID so that now they can go back, build second stage targeting just that process. Because now they no longer need to scan all the process memory, which takes some time. You may miss cards. Now we can target the specific process with the same regular expression. All the same output is the same. There's nothing else unique going on here. That's what's so interesting about this. They simply just target a new process. So now they're getting all the track data for that process being dumped to disk, same as before. These are the types of targeted processes they go after. You don't need to be in the PCI environment or have installed you know, POS software before, but simply looking at this list, you can quickly see right off the top, this probably is you know, going to contain track data of some sort. I'm guessing this looks familiar to some of you in the room, at least I'm hoping so. <clears throat> yeah, specifically, we see these particular processes used by all the major product vendors, right? Um, so they are well aware that you know they might have memory um, exposure, but by that point in time, if you're already having malware on the box, uh, it's a difficult problem. So then we get to this third part that we haven't talked about yet, which is Driftwood. Uh, Driftwood is the second executable that Dubru launches that is there simply to obfuscate data. And this is the part that I think is pretty unique for this attack group because they no longer just leave clear text on disk. And so they simply use a Perl to exe, again, super simple, you know, scripting language, build it to a binary, and allow that then to be executed by um, Dubru. So again, all of this stuff looks, you know, pretty normal on disk. You got two executables, and, and everything else looks, you know, just about normal. What happens, though, when they execute Driftwood, it's extremely noisy. It, there's a P to X temp directory. If any of you guys have used P to X, um, the Perl to, bi Perl to exe binary, it generates these um, associated libraries to help build this binary. And every time this execution runs, it essentially creates a brand new library, of direct directory of libraries based on that PID. And so you end up having around 50 or so DLLs that are then created uh, for each execution. And again, it's trivial to reverse engineer. There's not a whole lot going on. You could do the strings on it, and you'll basically get uh, an output file that looks like this. This is obviously, you know, uh, beautified, so to speak, but essentially the the strings are going to be there, all you know, nice and uh, readable and legible. Just to step back, the x the once it's uh, you know identified that particular output file from the FiendCry, it actually renames the file a, a fake DLL, usually within System32 or SysWow. That again, when you were to open up this particular uh, binary or the DLL that you think is odd, it's going to be encoded with a you know a simple novice. Um, XOR encoding routine, but it looks like binary data. And so it's not going to have your typical PE specification for a DL, DLL, uh, but by and large, you may not even understand or feel the need to look at it just because it's a DLL file. There's, there's tons in that, um, those directories. Again, this is the, the reverse engineer of Driftwood, Perl to EXE, simple to reverse engineer. You know, again, it's fast, it's easy. This is why they do this. Uh, the XOR encoding is a, a simple seven or eight word uh, encoding that, again, trivial to en reverse engineer, so you'll find that in those strings itself uh, that's in, you know, reverse XOR that uh, DLL file to get those track data. So now that they have a persistent mechanism in place to dump their credit cards to disk, they then 
still have you know legitimate legitimate access into the environment what they are afraid of is if by some chance they are noticed or discovered prior to them getting into the environment to retrieve this data they want access back into the environment so what they what we've identified is they have a simple p link like application that simply tunnels whatever they want out of the environment so what we've seen them do is set up persistent um, set up persistence using Dubru to then instead launch Flipside to just tunnel out RDP. So they'll set up a simple persistent mechanism that says tunnel RDP out to my um, IP address. Now you've got an RDP sitting out there in the event that they can't get back in using VPN, they'll come back in using RDP and you think that you've shut them out, you think you've you know reset all your credentials, you must be good. Well, we typically see Flipside on a completely random box. We don't usually see it on a point of sale or CDE card data environment host. We'll see this on a web server and a DMZ that you know may not have been touched by the RAM scraper, something they just identified and just went forward. Has anyone ever done any sort of um, event log hunting for RDP backdoors? There's a really, really easy giveaway if you're looking for this kind of stuff. What is the one place you can never RDP to a host from? Itself. So when you see an RDP log for a source host of 127.0.0.1, there is an anomaly in your environment. Something does not make sense. And so at this point, you know, they, they basically have the Dubru running. They've got track data going to disk. They're encoding their data. Now they need to complete the mission, right? So what we've identified is a couple of things can sometimes happen. One, they have enough cards or enough time has gone by, sometimes three months, sometimes six months, sometimes a year, where they've just been letting data build. They come back in. They check to make sure things are running. They leave. But if they happen to then sell this data, they will then go through the environment using S-Delete and they will burn all of it down. Simply because in the event that they are discovered, when you pull those for, you know, dead box forensics and you were to run like a regular expression yourself across the, the, the bits to see if you can find track data in the, on, on disk, you're not going to find it simply because either it was S-Deleted off the disk or it was simply encoded and you're just not, your regular expression just isn't going to hit period. And so they do this, again, to make sure that they can sell those cards without them being fraudulent. Because, again, on a Carter network, you know, their reputation on selling valid cards is kind of like an Uber driver. You know, they have five stars for selling great cars or selling great cards. And so, again, this type of information allows them to stay, you know, up on their game. And so they'll go through and they'll delete that information so that the card brands can't simply say, oh, we know this card was taken, so therefore we'll just send out a new card and that card's no longer usable. Anyone remember the name Rescator with regards to credit card dumps? Yeah, it's really, really, really hard to sell credit card dumps when you're that publicly known and when Krebs is calling you out every other day and everyone knows what site to go to to look for your dumps. These guys would rather stay under the wire and stay a little bit hidden. And so before they start doing a lot of that, we have also seen them dump credentials. So right before they're about to burn it, they want to make sure they still have an up-to-date set of credentials in the event that, you know, they, the administrator only... Um, simply resets the credentials that they've been using. They can use a different set to come back in, or just in the event that they, you know, miss something, et cetera. Or, you know, typically your local workstations will use some variation of a previous password. So summer 2016, you know, autumn 2016, we've seen it a dozen times. The attackers can understand that information and try to manipulate that data that way as well. And so here's, you know, a, a perfect example. How often are you guys clearing your own event logs? It's something that, honestly, we see that legitimate admins do, which, again, is up to you guys and, and your own endeavors, but it's generally not something that you're supposed to be doing or wanting to do at all. So event logs being cleared is another great hunting tool or tip to begin identifying malicious or you know, suspicious activity. So again, putting this all back into perspective and into the big picture, you know, we've seen each particular step for this attack group. And at this stage, you know, we can identify where they are in the entire attack lifecycle depending on the activity that we're seeing. All right, so, so I apologize if you all were expecting like some super advanced and sexy malware. It really is just as simple as uh, scan the 10 dot, uh, deploy some malware, get some credit card numbers, and then go buy a Lamborghini. But that being said, let's, uh, let's get into the fun part and that seven year part of the talk we we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> So, really, really simple timeline, 2008 until now. Now, I know, I know that that's actually eight years. Um, Press and I have yet to learn how to count. 
So um, bear with us as we go through this troubling period. It's very, very different. So our first point on the timeline is really, really easy. At the beginning of 2008, Visa came out and said, hey, FYI, uh, there's memory scraping POS malware out there you guys might want to watch out for. You'd expect the timeline to stop here, right? Because we all listen to advisories that come out. Not this group. Uh, one of the first activities we have from this group is going after a hotel chain in November 2008. Um, this timeline is going to get to be a lot of fun, but just take a look at the dates. November 8, November 2008 through April 2009. Let's jump ahead to 2009. Okay, not bad, guys. We held a campaign for a few months. We stole some credit card numbers, and then first data came out and said, hey, um, here we are again. Guess what? There's POS scraping malware out there that you guys might want to watch out for. We you stop here, right? No. This group said, cool your jets. Take it easy. We're going to come back in November 2009. Uh, this time we're going to target a government institution. Now, can anyone tell me why a government institution belongs inside of a financially motivated threat actor? Think about the industries we talked about. Anyone here ever work in the government? They got cafeterias, right? They got places you can buy food, you can buy things from. What a better test environment than an Air Force or a military base that I can test my malware out at, scrape some cards that are most likely going to be tied to the U.S. government, and just, you know, try things out. Um, staying in until August 2010. You know what? Let's go after another one as well. This is one of the first opportunities where we see them have dual infrastructures in place at the same time. First, military institution, November 2009 through August 2010. Second one, July 2010 through November 2010. This is a clear sign of an attacker becoming very, very confident and comfortable in their approach. This right here is the very reason why threat intelligence is so important. Because even if a report came out that burned the first campaign, you could have found them in the second campaign if threat intelligence was available. Now granted, this was back in 2010. Threat intelligence was not the multi-billion dollar buzzword that we're all used to it being now. So unfortunately, these institutions uh, lost some credit card numbers. Let's fast forward to 2013. We've had three years to be really, really comfortable. We've honed our attack. We know our malware. We've been editing code. We've been finding tweaks. Let's start early. February, I'm feeling a fresh new year. Start early. February 2013. We're going to keep this campaign in place for about a year and a half. Let's keep that in until August 2014. But you know what, guys? Uh, I think that a few of our compatriots over there are feeling a little slow. They're on the bench. We've got some utilization to burn. Next month, let's go after another one. This time, we're going to target a casino. Um, they've got a lot of credit card numbers, right? A lot of high rollers, people coming through. Um, okay, let's end 2013. You know, we're sitting good on two campaigns. No, no, no. The boss comes down and says, hey, guys, we're not meeting our numbers. December, we're going to drop into a third casino, or sorry, a second casino this year, and we're going to hang out in there for almost two years. 2014 is not looking too fun so far. This group has already got three active campaigns, two of them inside of casinos, so they're raking credit cards, and the other one inside of actually a credit card processor itself. My apologies, the red line is a credit card processor. So you'd kind of think that in the funnel of credit card processing, compromising the credit card processor would be the best place to go because then you just get everything at one point, but it's a lot easier to compromise an unsecured, flat, single auth hotel network than it is a potentially gives a little more of a crap credit card processor. Do you think they stopped here in 2014? Nah, man. Lamborghinis and Ferraris aren't going to buy themselves. February, let's go after a hotel. We're going to hang out in there for about six months. March, we're going to go after another casino. We're going to stay in there until about December 2015. Parking lots, they take credit cards, right? April 2014, let's go after them. We're going to hang out in there for about uh, six months. July, let's go after a hotel. Let's just, you know what, keep piling them on. Guys, anyone got any ideas? Any other industry we should go after? Hey, hey it's October. Why not another casino? 2014 is looking like a really profitable year. I'm really a fan of this, guys. I think I guarantee you could probably track this as some sports car payments. But 2014 gets even more interesting because at the end of it, we throw another hotel in just for good fun. Why not, right? Um, all of this is starting to look like uh, places I have staying and everyone's probably recounting their 2014 travel schedule. But wait, just when you thought this attacker was done and they had done enough, there's a slight little break in this particular casino. And the reason for that was a third party was called in to do an investigation. Remember I talked about these guys monitoring emails. They saw the email coming through. Not an email that said fraudulent credit cards have been detected. An email that said, hey, we're going to do an investigation because something doesn't look right. So they said, pause it. Put the brakes on. 
We're just going to monitor the emails and see what happens. We're just going to wait and see. Um, well, as you can imagine, because the line continues, and I'm terrible with PowerPoint animations, the investigation ended. They found two machines, three machines. So the, the particular firm uh, pulled, did dead box forensics, you know, ran their track data, a regular expression across that uh, those hosts, had no hits, as a no findings uh, investigation, moved on. No they're, big deal. <laughs> they're already like six months in and uh, nothing there. Now right, you're clear. So they just picked up back operations and said, let's keep going. 2015, we've already got four campaigns going on. We're hanging out in hotels. We've got casinos down pat. We're not going to stop here. March 2015, really, really, really funny case. Um, they got into this environment. We found their malware in this environment. Anyone think of why it only lasted a month? Credit card data was tokenized. So there was nothing to steal. So they just got out and said, all right, forget it. Just leave the artifacts behind. Don't need to worry about it. At the same time, Visa and Trend Micro come out and alert and say, hey, guys, I know we were here seven years ago, but we're back now. And uh, raw POS is kind of a really big deal, right? Take a look at those dudes slide from 2014. Um, and attackers are specifically targeting the hospitality industry. Do you think this attack group said, guys, they're onto us, we should stop? Nope. December 2015, they simultaneously went after two hotel groups at the same time and maintained persistence in there until June 2016. <clears throat> I'm focusing on this one really quick. This is actually from 2014 into 2015. I'm focusing on this for one particular reason, primarily because 2014 was my favorite year. But just to talk about how this group operates. January 19, 2015, they exfilled their card data. Oops, I'm sorry. January 27th is when the third party notification came through to the organization. So we have an eight day window, which is unheard of for a lot of attack groups between burning the forest down and someone actually detecting and knowing what you're doing. And that is very indicative of we're going to sell the first little batch of cards. It's enough that they're going to detect the fraud. And I'm not saying this from the attacker's point of view. It's enough that the card brands can detect the fraud, but it's not large enough that they immediately burn the environment or that they give up all their cards. So they burn it down, take out the exfil, and then the third party notification happens. So you can see they're very, very in tune with how this process works. Sorry, we're jumping ahead into 2016 and uh, entering the year. Um, we had three hotels or February, they decided to compromise the third hotel despite everyone saying, hey, hospitality, watch out. We have the two previous campaigns that ran until June. And then, as we mentioned earlier, we had one two days ago that just picked up. So since 2008, this group has been extremely prolific and successful at pulling things back. And the worst part is these two are the exact same organization. <clears throat> womp, womp. So what do we get from these timelines? Crossover points are our simultaneous footholds, an ind indication that your attacker is becoming extremely advanced and comfortable. That is the worst thing the attacker can be is comfortable, either comfortable with their approach or comfortable with your network. I hate to say it, there's a lot of cases we walk into where the attack group knows the network better than the people who are defending the network. The number of times I've heard a, oh, I didn't know we had that access point, is exactly what these guys are banking on. Overlapping timelines, same deal, operational maturity. We also have identical C2 communications. Now, we didn't go into the whole C2 traffic here. However, we have a lot of reuse infrastructure. The reason why, and I'm going back in time a little bit here, the reason why we keep harping on the notifications to the industry is that it was the same information. Maybe it was updated MD5s, but it was the same file names, the same attack vector, same type of approach that the attacks were taking. And then media notifications is when we see our group change from very, very prolific in the beginning with stage one fiend cry to very targeted with stage two to burn the entire thing down. They have a methodical approach that they go through. And I know it sounds kind of like I'm complimenting them, it kind of works. They are very, very successful. Let's talk a little bit though, now that we've looked at just how much havoc these guys have caused, let's talk about finding them. Because the worst thing you can do is walk out of this presentation and go, crap, I have not looked at this data. And so specifically here, what, what we also want to be sure to, to kind of identify is, is this also works for your particular threat actor that might be targeting your company. So again, hunting, again, a, you know, a million dollar buzzword, but something that we still don't see happening uh, widespread. So we want to touch on hunting in a general uh, concept as well, but also specifically for this attack group because uh, they both lend themselves pretty easily. So again, shim cache trees, you guys are familiar with this. This is a, a great uh, source of evidence for sy uh, system execution or program execution. This, you know, again, helps application compatibility for Windows. So every time 
uh, an executable is executed, it will show up in Shimcache. Um, searching through Shimcache, dumping Shimcache, looking for this evidence uh, is a very specific way that we can identify and scope uh, this particular attack group. So we're looking for things like psexec. We're looking for that frame package.exe that we know is a renamed psexec. We're looking for dobrew and we're looking for fiendcry. Those types of things. And when you are in an environment that has fin5, you will see this on every host. And it becomes, you know, extremely verbose and voluminous in data. But you will be able to see very easily. Whenever we go into an environment that particularly has CPP, that, you know, we, it might be a, host, uh, a hotel, we run through our shim cache queries. You know, we can identify Fin5 in a matter of minutes. We, we had the, you know, the, the nice opportunity to do an entire investigation in 48 hours. It was crazy. We did from start to finish. We nailed this Fin5 down to a key. And so, you know, we'll provide a PowerShell script that, you know, again, to go through this information. But a lot of this stuff can be done through PowerShell. You don't need special tools. A lot of the stuff is open source that you can just be in, uh, cracking the data open. Again, additional data to begin hunting for, right? So system event logs. We already talked about some of the events that, you know, happens over that attack lifecycle, specifically PS exec, right? You'll see those service entries in the system event logs. You'll see the modified service name potentially. You'll see the binary uh, path in that actual frame package and declared events. Again, that's a huge uh, indicator for anomalous traffic, in my opinion, anomalous behavior is cleared event logs. Unless it was you who cleared it, again, I would be suspicious of anything that looks cleared in your environment. It just shouldn't be happening. Uh, again, monitoring VPN logs. Like it, Again, if you have a large environment, it may not be that simple, but you need to get your handle on what is quote unquote normal, again, a baseline for your environment, which can be difficult, but you have to begin looking at this data, start hunting for things that might be anomalous, that's one way to do it. Non-standard GOIP locations, that type of information that shouldn't occur. Vendor accounts, you should have a great handle on what vendor accounts are being accessed to VPN. If you are if you do have a PCI environment or a CDE environment, obviously being PCI compliant can sometimes mean different things, but your vendor accounts should be turned off when they're not in use. Turning them back on when you know a vendor needs to get in, it's a headache, but again, PCI compliance dictates such. So understanding what those PCI compliance looks like is important as well as knowing who your domain admins are and protecting that privilege, right? Being able to check that, that those credentials in and out are, uh, you know, a powerful tool to use. And then firewall logs. Again, a, a very voluminous amount of data. Uh, understanding what is allowed in your environment is, is critical too. So RDP being um, allowed externally, it's internal, most likely not the case. Uh, what about external? Are you watching for that information? If it's, you know, over a non-standard port, are you checking that information? Stuff like that to allow you to hunt. What's unique about this particular attack group, and these are the types of indicators that we build and things that you probably should be looking at uh, from, you know, your own particular concept or, or a particular threat, what's common amongst these types of tools that I can then begin querying across the environment? And this one is, is really unique because they use a Borland uh, compiler to build their malware. And so what, what we see here is there's two specific exports that are in all your Borland compilers. Uh, so you will have false positives. This doesn't specifically mean this is Fin5 data. It just means that Borland was used to compile it. In a Fin5 environment, almost not, nine times out of ten, it's going to be their malware. So now we can begin querying the environment, looking at your um, specific PEs and System32 or Windows, looking for these particular exports, and begin then doing additional deep dives to see if this is at all a true positive or it's related. So uh, I reference uh, Matt Graber's uh, GitHub here. He has a uh, PowerShell arsenal tool. We couldn't talk about this. PowerShell without mentioning Matt Graver. Absolutely. Just had to throw him in there. And so this will allow you to begin using PowerShell to get to that data. Again, nothing special off the top other than having access to this particular commandlet. All right, with just a minute or two left, uh, getting into some recommendations real quick. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about places to start looking for this attacker. Um, if you're in an environment where you are really, really suffering in the security realm, think about really, really easy things. Two-factor authentication, application whitelisting, hardening the CDE, all these things should be done if you're processing cards. Other considerations, again, removing local admin, work, restrict workstation to workstation, and consider a point-to-point uh, -point encryption. The first two bullet points here really just make it more difficult to move throughout your environment. The, set, the third and final one makes it really, really difficult to scrape card data out of memory. 
Anyone now seeing those little Verifone things everywhere that we've got to use? Anyone here from Canada and you've had them for like 20 years and you come to America and you're like, I, why are you taking my card away from me? Um, they've had them for a long time. Those things work. They work really, really well. And last but not least, centralize your antivirus alerts and look at them. I know we already covered it and this room's clear. Everyone here has already admitted out loud and on camera that they monitor their AV 24-7. So we're never going to run into any of those issues. But seriously, you're collecting logs, you're collecting data, use it. The number of places we've done an investigation at and we dump av, AV logs and it's been in there for years. The majority of those colored lines on the timeline slide, AV logs already had it. No one was paying attention. No one was looking at it. And last but not least, find your own FIN5. So if there are any fans here who would like to dig into some Shimcache parsing, I know you're surprised Mandiant guys talking about Shimcache. Uh, probably caught you off guard a little bit there. Not China though. Um, here's a really, really easy Power, uh, PowerShell command to dump Shimcache out of any host you want to. I would definitely dump this on your credit card processors. And then use a script to really simply parse it and take a look for some of the things we talked about, some files that don't make place. With that, that brings us right up to our time. We wanted to see if anyone had any questions, but most importantly, thank you all for attending today. Yes? So um, there was no way to write this on the slide, but we definitely do not have the full scope of how prolific they've been because we're just one in a pool of, of many investigators. Um, but based on what we're seeing about this group and the different news articles out there and things that just get released, um, I, I'm not, I don't have a number, but there's a very high statistical chance when raw POS is involved and it was a credit card breach, you're most likely going to see either these guys or if there exists some sort of splinter of these guys. They're, they're without a doubt the masters of using this one. Um, but I would say the majority of the data comes, you're right, from just our investigations and just our experience and just our attribution. There is a percentage of things we are not seeing um, simply because we don't have exposure to it. So, And if there are any firms as well, the other thing to consider is we're seeing a lot of stuff because it's fraudulently it's detected, fraudulently used. There's a lot of organizations, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that caught this maybe early on in the process. And they burned things down, they eradicated it, and they got rid of it. And the attacker never really had a chance to get caught. So there's a couple different avenues of data we don't have. But yeah, very, very good point. Anyone else? Yeah. I'd, I'd say, I'll, I'll go ahead, Preston. You know, process, you know, tens of thousands of cards that, you know, again, their business, the particular, you know, garages, their business isn't security. They don't care. If, if this happens to be their first time they're going through uh, an a compromise, then maybe. Uh, to say it's dying, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, with chip and pin, is it becoming more difficult? Absolutely. Uh, again, the implementation is in, uh, the details are in the implementation. If you store your uh, encryption key in the same database as your, uh, you know, implementation, yeah, we've seen it where, you know, attackers can grab that encryption key, decrypt that those cards on the wire, now you're back to the same problem. So is this dying? It's probably getting more difficult is what I would, you know, how I'd call it. I'd I, it. I'll add on to that. I'll say the, the scariest part about DDoSing is DDoSing for hire, especially, again, back to Brian Krebs, um, a good example of when someone is really good at something, aka corralling thousands of IoT devices around the world and launching a massive attack, they're going to sell that service. So this group, while there's a possibility that pin and chip and encryption and end-to-end -end encryption are, are causing issues for them, they still maintain a reputation as a group that can very, very efficiently infect an environment, spread a file around an environment, find something in memory, and effectively pull it back. So honestly, Fiend Cry Stage 1, you'd have to just put in a new regex, and all of a sudden these guys become a PII-targeted threat actor. It can morph very, very quickly. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I haven't seen any data on that. Uh, I'm not sure, I, Preston, I, if you have. Um, I would imagine, though, that they are. They've, they've got to be. There's just no way it's it's not helping out. Um, same with, like, Square, et cetera. Yeah, we were actually talking about this at lunch today. I'm really nervous because now every time I swipe at Square, I get an email with my receipt without giving my email. I'm kind of like, what is it you guys are tracking? 
Um, last four in name doesn't seem to be unique enough, but uh, if anyone here is from Square and wants to answer that, we'd love to hear it. No? Okay. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, Appreciate it. Have fun in Grand Rapids. <laughs>